Dana told me I should tell this story. This is a story about miscommunication. Has miscommunication ever happened where you work, serve, in your marriage, anywhere? Never, right? Uh, so we were in Mongolia and serving there, and we were in the city of Erdenets, and our former directors in Canada, Rob and his wife Pat, Rob and Pat were coming to visit us. We were very excited because um, Rob and Pat were coming to visit. We were very excited, our first visitors. Uh, we've been there for a little while and really looking forward to seeing them. They are a lovely, warm, welcoming, caring couple. And they were going to visit their, they have a daughter and her family who were living in China at the time, so they were going to visit them, and then from there, they were coming to see us. And when, the night before, I think, they were arriving, we got a text from Rob saying, all is well, travel's going well, um, at the airport or something now, we love you guys. And we thought, oh, that's so sweet, it's Rob, you know, he loves us. Oh, that's great. So we're really touched by that. You know, we've been there for a while. We're looking forward to seeing them. And then when we went to the airport to pick them up, uh, we were talk- chatting with them, and Marina said to Rob, you know, Rob, thanks for that text. That was just really, really sweet and encouraging for us. That, uh, and Rob said, what text? He said, yeah, you know, like the text about how you're coming, you're excited, and, and you love us, and we just really want you to know, Rob, we love you guys too, and we really appreciate it. You're, you're coming, and he said, oh, that, that was for our kids. <laughs> kind of deflating. I, I feel like this is maybe, maybe bitten off a little more than I can chew on this topic, uh, uh, this idea we've gone through talking about kenosis yesterday, and today tackling this thing called Gnosticism. Who goes to camp to hear it talks about things like kenosis and Gnosticism? Um, I didn't read the manual about, you know, ten things to do or not to do when speaking at a camp. But I want to try and tackle this, if that's okay. Uh, and I hope this won't be fraught with miscommunication. I feel, I feel a little bit like this is out of my wheelhouse a bit. Gnosticism, to me, is a slippery topic and hard to define. So naturally, I'll try and define it. Uh, or we'll try and define it together and talk about it. And also, it's Thursday today, is that right? Um, and I feel like I'm moving a little bit slower than Wednesday or Tuesday. Um, so I hope this isn't just a perfect storm of putting everyone to sleep today. Um, if that's the case, fine. We'll just chalk it up to miss that one. And uh, tomorrow will be great, right? I think this is an important... Uh, discussion, nonetheless, um, mostly because I, from just some of the things I've read and, and perceptions, I think that this is pervasive in our own world still today. If you've done any Bible school studies, you learn about Gnosticism in church history, uh, early church stuff. But, but I think this is still around. And I think more than anything else, this discussion today will just kind of serve as a way for us to kind of put our antennas up and, and to catch uh, waves of things. Just a little, help us to be maybe a little more discerning uh, in, in pegging things that maybe are not so healthy for us. That's my goal, at least. I hope that it will serve as that. So what I'd like to do is, well, I'll, I'll try my best to, to we'll talk about Gnosticism in the early church, help define it. Then we're going to look at how Paul approach to this, and specifically in his letter to 1 Corinthians. We'll jump around a lot in 1 Corinthians and look at how Paul reacts to Gnosticism, and then just try and highlight how I think Gnosticism is still around in our various contexts. So, more than anything else, this will just be kind of a precautionary session, a way for us to kind of raise red flags once in a while and say, I think this sounds familiar. Or I think we've, I've heard about this before, what I'm experiencing. So it won't be terribly uplifting. Uh, it's just more of a, a way for us to, to guard ourselves a little. Gnosticism at camp. Brilliant. What was I thinking? 
Okay, here's um, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda in kind of like Jedi ghost form, right? Where you can kind of attain this level of enlightenment in, Je in the Jedi religion and just kind of appear wherever you need to appear, whenever you need to appear and be there. Um, I think this will help. I think you'll connect the dots at some point. Uh, Gnosticism and the spiritual elite. So, just to help define it, the word comes from another Greek word. It's gnosis, and uh, gnosis is comprehension or intellectual grasp or something. It's knowledge. Gnosis is knowledge. Uh, we use this word even in English still when we talk about an agnostic. An agnostic is someone who has no knowledge. Literally is what it means. Don't point fingers. An agnostic is someone who doesn't know, one way or the other, what is really out there. Does God exist? Uh, what belief system should we follow? I don't know. I'm not sure. Right? That's an agnostic. So a gnostic uh, comes from the same word. Gnosticism, gnosis, or knowledge. So that's the idea, the background of it. Um, gnostics believed that they contained a special spiritual, secret knowledge that was the key to salvation. They were those in the know. And this was a big hurdle in the early church. This was kind of when Hebrew worldviews collided with Greek Platonic worldviews, and you get out of this mix Gnosticism. Um, so Gnosticism was grounded in the belief that privileged spiritual knowledge is the key to salvation. Privileged spiritual knowledge is the key to salvation. Gnostics were characterized by a few things, one of which, the, the, the kind of the more fundamental idea was that matter is evil and the spirit is good. Matter is evil, the spirit is good. The world we are living in is fundamentally evil in and of itself. And we're seeking an escape from this world. They believed that human beings were really spirits imprisoned in earthly bodies. And the goal, therefore, of salvation is escape from the physical world and our physical bodies. The world is not our true home, but an exile from our true spiritual home, heaven or something like that. Does that sound familiar? Um, the idea, at least my understanding of, of Jesus and Gnosticism. The Gnosticism was tricky because it was it kind of floated in and out of the church. You could have Gnostics that weren't really Christians. You could have Gnostics floating inside the church and kind of syncretizing Christian beliefs with their own beliefs. So the idea of Jesus and Gnosticism that G Jesus was significant in that he was really a messenger who gives us the knowledge of escape from matter and the physical world. They denied that Jesus had a physical body like us, though. It couldn't happen because physical stuff, matter, is problematic, right? So they denied uh, things like the birth of Jesus, the incarnation, uh, as that would have implied that he was submitted to this physical world, this evil world, and that was problematic. So the Christian church had problems with Gnosticism. You can probably guess a few of them. One is that uh, Gnosticism denied its several crucial doctrines like creation, right? The Hebrew scriptures show, tell us that God created the world and that it, day after day after day he creates the world and he sees that it is good. Tov, tov, tov in Hebrew over and over and over again. It's good, good, good. Now, the world is good. Gnosticism didn't, didn't, couldn't mesh with that. They couldn't handle that. They believed that that the world was kind of made out of this cosmic battle between good and evil, and, and all of it was essentially the result of that, and it's, a, it's an awful, in and of itself, uh, it's, it's an evil place, evil thing. So they denied the, the doctrine of creation. They also denied the doctrine of incarnation, right? That God would become, take on human flesh. Uh, we talk about kenosis, emptying himself, becoming human, and, uh, and, uh, and taking the form of a servant. It can't happen, right? That, would, that couldn't possibly happen. And they would also deny, therefore, the doctrine of the resurrection, resurrection of the body. We don't want resurrected bodies. Bodies are problems. They're evil. So we shun that kind of stuff, and we look for a kind of a spiritual, ghostly existence uh, after, in the afterlife for eternity. 
not not really an organized religion, so this is why it becomes difficult to kind of peg. They didn't have organized churches or communities or books of doctrine or things like that. Uh, it was more like a philosophy of a movement that would kind of sneak in and out of different uh, areas, including the church, the Christian church. So, Gnosticism is characterized by it's characterized by an emphasis on spiritual knowledge, or gnosis. Secondly, uh, it's it's characterized by a hierarchy of spiritual accomplishments, uh, kind of enlightenment that you work your way up towards right? through this knowledge, through your disciplines. And then C, it's characterized by a devaluation of material and physical life, and corresponding avoidance of ethical struggle in this material world. That's important. We'll come back to that. If you shun the world, you've got no real concern with people who are hurting in this world, because we're just all trying to get out of it, right? So, we'll look at uh, Paul's approach to this, especially in 1 Corinthians. Uh, Gnosticism tended to breed a... uh, How are we doing? Is that okay so far? with me, tracking. Gnosticism bred a spiritual elitism, an upper class uh, with privileged knowledge. And Paul was up against this big time in the Corinthian church, right? Tiered Christianity, a tiered church. There's Christians, and then there's real Christians, super Christians, those who have this knowledge in their own. And so he warns the Corinthians uh, uh, things like this. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 7, not all possess knowledge, he says. Gnosis. Not everyone possesses gnosis. So get over it, he's trying to say to them, right? And then throughout the book, he also kind of responds sarcastically to the Corinthian church, referring to their knowledge or their wisdom uh, in a lot of different spots, uh, kind of calling them out for this idea that some of them have this heightened wisdom or heightened knowledge that they've kind of climbed this ladder to a second tier of enlightened Christian being, right? So he calls them out on that. He says things like, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he might become wise. He flips it around on them, right? This is not about becoming really wise in the way that you think. If you think you're wise, become a fool first, and then you'll see your wisdom. He says as well uh, in chapter 4, verse 10, We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. He's being sarcastic here, talking about the apostles and their in their folly and in their weakness, and then these Corinthians who think they're so wise and so strong and so honored. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 5, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? You brag about this heightened knowledge that you've attained, and you can't even fix the problems in your own midst. The whole church is splintered and divided and falling apart at the seams. He hopes to win them back throughout this letter. He hopes to win them back to his message that God's subversive plan to make foolish the wisdom of the world. He wants to win them back to this pl- this message that God's plan is to make foolish the wisdom of the world. And he levels them out a bit, reminding the Corinthians of their humble beginnings. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many in- were influential Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 
Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So there's a leveling going on here that Paul is trying to accomplish. He's trying to kind of lay things out flat. We just get rid of this tiered Christianity about enlightened, wise people. Uh, we will all start off pretty weak, pretty broken, pretty needy, right? Needy on God's, for God's grace. So, uh, as he continues through the book, by chapter 8, Paul is shifts the conversation then from talking about knowledge and wisdom, and then he shifts it to a discussion on love and emphasizes that it's not us who know God. We can kind of attain this knowledge of God, but it's God who knows us through his love. This is a great passage. He says, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagined that he knows something, not yet know as he ought to know. But, if anyone loves God, he is known by God. That's a great flip. Uh, he turns this whole discussion around. This is not about us and our knowledge, kind of our intellectualism or anything like that. This is about us loving God. And as we do that, he knows us. That is what's happening here in the Christian life. That's good news, right? keeps going uh, on and on and on. And in, in, in the backdrop of this co- correspondence between Paul and the Corinthians, uh, this sheds new light as we read chapters, you know, fa- chapters that we all know, like chapter 13, it's the chapter on love. Uh, if, we have, if you ever get married, everyone wants to read uh, 1 Corinthians 13 you know, at, at their wedding because it seems to talk about love a lot, so it would, must be fitting uh, to talk about it at a wedding. And it is. But this is the background of this whole discussion on love. He says, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. For now we see only in a, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. You see what Paul is trying to do here? He's pulling down the spiritual hierarchy that is causing division within the Corinthian church. And it's also why he spends so much time on topics like the resurrection in, in chapter 15, right? He's, he's combating this Gnostic uh, rejection of the, of the physical and the bodily. He's saying, no, 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 no. We stake ourselves on the bodily resurrection of the dead. That's our story. That's our promise that's held out to us. Uh, and we, we, we cling to that. So we can see that from reading... Uh, Reading 1 Corinthians in its context, I think this book is strongly an anti-Gnostic text, trying to level out this kind of division and this heresy that is growing in the, in the Corinthian church. So does this exist today, do you think? Gnosticism um, is like kryptonite. Sorry, the cross is like kryptonite to Gnosticism. If you, if you believe in this kind of a worldview, ascribe to this, you have no need for a crucified Savior uh, because you can attain your salvation through this heightened knowledge, through these practices, through this deeper meaning and deeper understanding of things. Um, so, so the cross really pulls the Gnosticism apart. And that's why Paul is so keen to pull back and remind people, root people on this event of the crucifixion of Jesus because we have levels I want to spend a, a few minutes just looking at how this may or may, may not flesh out for us today. I think we've probably got a good handle on it already. Uh, a few few quotes here. It, Gnosticism is elitist. It has an elitist and secretive character. It's demonstrated, for example, when Buddha says this uh, about his own teaching. This doctrine is profound, recondite. I need to look that word up. Little known, it means. This doctrine is profound, recondite, hard to comprehend, rare, 
excellent, beyond dialectic, subtle, only to be understood by the wise. Sounds like a lot of Eastern philosophy, I think. And I think this is the, yeah, we say the connection with the Jedi religion, right? Uh, this stuff is kind of rooted in similar backgrounds. But it's also uh, the default posi- position, I think, of a lot of Westerners and of Western uh, thinking. Here's a quote by Richard John Newhouse, who was a Lutheran theologian, I believe, who converted to Catholicism. He said, modern day Gnosticism is the natural religion of Americans, including American Christians. Feel good religion and spiritual pills to elevate our consciousness and enhance our sense of comfort with our presumably real selves. These are American specialties of long standing. I'd include Canadians in that discussion, too. Gnosticism today is exemplified in people who claim to be spiritual but not religious, right? It's a privatized thing. It makes faith individual. We talked about that as well. It, it makes faith individual with private and personal disciplines and exercises that result in having little bearing on our actual struggle against sin and the powers of this world. Because it's about escaping this world not rectifying or redeeming this world or participating with God in his redeeming of this world. It's more about our capacity to attain a higher spiritual plane, which makes the crucifixion unnecessary. Someone can meditate regularly and make make more spiritual progress, attaining a place among the spiritual elite, rather than someone who can only repeat a few mantras and then gets distracted and has to start all over again later on. Uh, a tiered spirituality. Um, here's Fleming Rutledge from our book, uh, The First Day That I Introduced You To. This is a long quote, but it's really good. This is what she says on contemporary Gnosticism and the Christian call to redemptive suffering. Virtually all human religion is Gnostic, she writes. The eclectic religiosity of America today emphasizes individual spiritual experiences. We just talked about this. Individual spiritual experiences with a corresponding lack of interest in the human struggle for justice and dignity. The great Eastern faiths have many Gnostic tendencies with rigorous spiritual disciplines for the elite and popular undemanding rituals like prayer wheels, amulets, and idols for the masses. It seems likely that the versions of Buddhism so popular in America today are actually types of Gnostic spirituality. The Dalai Lama continues to attract adoring crowds wherever he goes, but there are many points of difference between what he has to say and the theology of the cross. In an interview with Gustav Niebuhr of the New York Times, he sought to explain his appeal with this observation. We all desire happiness and wish to avoid suffering. How many of American Christians hearing this would realize how different it is from, for example, Martin Luther King's often repeated summons to redemptive suffering? Let us be clear, however. Christianity does not recommend suffering for its own sake, and it is a part of the Christian's task in the world to alleviate the suffering of others. By no stretch of the imagination, however, could Christianity ever be said to recommend the avoidance of suffering in the cause of love and justice. It's different from what the Dalai Lama is saying, right? We, we, can't, we can't love people by escaping suffering ourselves. Uh, we have to enter into the suffering of others. Perhaps the clearest way to sum this up is to say that the Christian faith, when anchored in the preaching of the cross, recognizes and accepts the place of suffering in the world for the sake of Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, said Jesus on the mount. So it doesn't mesh. It does not mesh with the story of the cross, does it? When Gnosticism begins to creep into the church, it conveys a righteousness by knowledge alone, including self-help doctrines, educated elitism, intellectual righteousness, and things like that. And consequently, if it's spiritual knowledge that saves us, we don't need the crucifixion. We just need the right teacher and a working brain, right? That's all we need. 
And that's the point that Paul is making to the Corinthians. If we busy ourselves trying to get into a room where only mature Christians speak in tongues, um, we undermine the cross. One last one from, from Fleming Rutledge. Allowing for all of Gnosticism's varieties, we can safely say this in summary. In Gnosticism's portrayal of salvation, the power to redeem, it's God's power, has been subsumed into our capacity for being redeemed. That's a, that's a shift that happens in Gnosticism. The power to redeem, which is God's power, has been subsumed into our capacity for being redeemed. And this is the position of all human religions. The onus is placed on us, and we must be found capable of redemption, if you talk even in those terms. I found uh, our text this morning to be really uh, poignant. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. God created man upright, mankind upright, but we've gone in search of many schemes. So let's have a little discussion in our groups again for five or seven minutes or so. And here's some questions to discuss. How would you define Gnosticism? Do you agree that it is predominant, predominant in contemporary spirituality? And how so? Christianity too? Is that the case? How is the Christian gospel good news for those who are not spiritual elites, nor capable of becoming spiritual elites? So how do you define Gnosticism? Is it really around? Is it even in the church? If so, how? How is the Christian gospel good news for people who can't become spiritual elites? And then third, the gospel calls us to active engagement in the world, not escape from it. How can suffering for the sake of others be a redemptive exercise, experience? How can suffering for the sake of others be a redemptive experience? Um, any, any final thoughts or comments or observations about this this morning? We've learned a lot of things, a lot of good things from historical criticism, but the weakness of it is that it creates uh, a, you know, a deeper meaning behind the text. And if we can just study it and figure this out and corner it, we can figure out what's really being spoken in the text rather than what's being said, you know, kind of at face value sometimes. Yeah, that's true. And you create an intellectual elitism uh, whereby these professionals now know for the rest of us. And I don't want to be anti-academic or anything. I think we need... Yeah. yeah. We believe... Here's a big word for you. We believe in the perspicuity of Scripture, meaning that Scripture is available and understandable to all peoples of all different places, of all different levels of intellect. So you don't have to be a smart person to understand the, the meaning of Scripture. The core of it is there for even... You know, little children can get it, right? When you teach them these stories, um, it's, it's it's available and accessible to everyone. We we can kind of rag on. We can um, perhaps uh, we talked about clericalism earlier and kind of this heightened spirituality. But I think we need to be careful as well. Those of us who come from a more pietistic background, that this is a danger for pietists as well to create a, a Christian faith that is privatized personal, I've got my prayer life, and at its worst, pietism is always criticized as what? Quietism, right? This doesn't have any bearing on anything that's going on around my immediate circumstance. Or we might elevate, we talk about experience above all other things, right? My spiritual experience trumps everything else. Um, and that's the danger that pietists have gotten into when they've gone off the rails a bit, too. So we, we need to be aware of that, too. This is a ditch. This is a ditch that any of us can fall into. Our experiences are important. They no doubt inform who we are and our lives and our beliefs and everything. But our subjective experiences must point to the objective truth of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. The truth of the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we uh, this is a heady topic. It's pretty conceptual. Um, it's kind of abstract. Lord, we just we do not want this to be left in the realm of, of, of 
just ideas. We want this to hit the ground with us. We want this to be informing and changing our lives and our, our lives of faith. We want this to inform us as we seek to follow you. We thank you for the witness of the apostles, the witness of the scripture that points to this truth against challenges difficulties against um, false teaching that has pointed to the truth of your love for us, the goodness of the world you made, uh, and your love to the point of entering human history, suffering and dying for us, that we might be saved. We ask that your spirit would continue to keep this message core to who we are and all that we do. We ask that you would give us little antennas um, just to kind of catch uh, God when things are kind of going astray or going off the rails. We want to be aware of the ditch that we can slide into. And so we thank you for people who have studied and who have done hard work, scholarly work, historical work, and who are able to articulate for us um, some of these ditches that even still exist today. Keep us aware of that. Thank you for the promise that you uh, will guard your church, your, that gates of hell will not prevail over it, uh, but that you hold us near to your heart and in safety. We are yours. We pray that this, uh, we pray that this would uh, not just fall on deaf ears, but that the truth in this session today, if there's any truth in it, we pray that your spirit would 